My name is Alexa, and I'm from Nelson Laboratories, and we're based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And I am happy to be able to speak to you this afternoon about cleaning validations for newly manufactured medical devices and single-use implants. These validations will encompass testing, examining the surface residues left over from the manufacturing and cleaning processes. So to begin, what is a cleaning validation? There are three important points to cover during a cleaning validation. That you have documented data that your cleaning process is effective and consistent at removing the surface residues from your device from the cleaning and manufacturing process. It's important to have documented data. If an auditor came to your facility and questioned whether you have a clean device and you say yes, how can you back up that claim? What evidence do you have to show that you have manufactured a clean device? It also needs to be effective at removing residues. Can you remove those residues from the surface of the device? And is it consistent? Do you have reproducibility to show that your cleaning process is effective? There are two main benefits of performing a cleaning validation, the first being for patient safety. If a device is not clean, it can be potentially harmful for patients if there are residues that are left over that are cytotoxic that could cause an adverse tissue response. The effect to the function of device can also be impacted with residues left over from the manufacturing process. For example, if there are too many oils left over on the device, the implant, for example, would not be able to correctly adhere to the patient's bone, and so the effect to the function of the device can also be impacted from residues being left over. These validations also satisfy regulatory authorities such as the FDA. And these validations are a hot topic in the industry right now. We've seen increased awareness from the FDA, especially requiring these uh, validations and asking them of people. And so also product contamination can cause serious liabilities for manufacturers and larger vendors as well if there was a recall. And so these are very, very important to complete. These are also a GMP requirement. The GMP states that manufacturers shall have procedures in place for the removal and reduction of manufacturing material so it is limited to an amount that will not affect the quality of a device. So we get a lot of people asking us, you know, why do we have to do this testing? Um, are our larger vendors requiring us to provide this data? And it's important to note that this is a requirement actually of the, of the good manufacturing practices to have this validation on file. There's not too much guidance out there in the industry on these validations. However, there is one standard that addresses these cleaning validations as a whole. And this standard was developed by the ASTM committee, ASTM 2847, that was published in January 2011. And this guidance document goes over a variety of test options commonly used for these types of validations. The method describes analytical test methods to quantify the surface residues, pairing them with microbiological tests, for example, to help provide additional data about those residues. I also want to point out that this standard, again, also um, only addresses the surface residue contamination and not leachables by design. And also this standard does not specify any limits or acceptance criteria, but we are starting to see movement towards that in the industry. There are two documents in the works that we wanted to point out, both from the ASTM. The first is a designing for cleanability working document. And this is specific for mostly biomedical engineers, but we're seeing a trend where people are starting to think about the cleaning validation up front and in designing their device and the process. Uh, for example, we were reading in a magazine the other day that a lubricant used in the manufacturing process was being marketed as being non-cytotoxic and that it would pass the ME evolution test. And so we're seeing people starting to go this route where they're thinking about the cleaning validation up front and how to remove those residues and choose components that would be made more easier to remove, for example. There are also, there's also a working document in place for establishing limits. And uh, again, currently there's no regulatory acceptance criteria for these validations as a whole. And so that makes it very difficult for the manufacturers to justify those residue levels. Uh, but we will discuss 
some options later in this presentation of trends we've seen in the industry and other companies use to justify these residue levels. Um, also, as a note, we had some of our scientists attend the most recent ASTM committee a few months ago in October, and we actually think with this working document that they're still not going to come out with an actual number as a limit value, uh, but this working document would be more of a guide on how to justify those residue levels again. And so just to point out, we're, we're still not sure if they're going to come out with a number yet, uh, but, but more ideas on how to justify the overall residue levels. And so it will still be up to the manufacturer to, to have that burden of, of justifying the whole validation. When to validate the cleaning process, the assessment of cleanliness um, needs to be performed in an initial validation if there's no previous data on file. Also, revalidation or additional testing should be completed when there's a change in the process. For example, if there's a change in the device material or a new component is introduced into the process. For example, if you introduced a new detergent in your process, it could be more sudsy and more difficult to remove from the surface of the device. And so if you have a change in a cleaning agent or even any step in the process, you should revalidate and do additional testing to make sure that no additional contaminants were introduced to the device. Also, if you change facilities, even if there was no change in the process, if you move facilities, we recommend revalidation just again to make sure that no other contaminants were introduced being in a new location. And here is the outline for the remainder of the presentation. We're going to be talking about how to establish your purpose and goal and why are you doing this cleaning validation. Then we'll go over a sampling plan and how to decide which samples would be best for you to test. And then we're going to go over determining your potential contaminants that your device comes in, process, comes in contact with in the processes. And then we'll go over choosing a test method and a little bit more in detail about the tests we offer at our laboratory. And then at the end, we'll cover justifying those residue levels and trends we've seen in the industry from other companies. To establish a purpose and goal of this validation, what are you trying to achieve? We want to have a clean device. Am I able to remove those residues from the manufacturing and cleaning process? Am I producing a biocompatible device free of cytotoxic residuals? Am I reducing microbiological contamination such as bioburden and endotoxin? And sometimes people are also trying to improve the cleaning process, adding more steps, taking out steps. Do those additional steps introduce more residue? Are they beneficial to implement? And so a lot of people have a different goal in mind when they're doing a cleaning validation, and these are very, very common and what people are trying to achieve in the cleaning validation. Um, and a, an example as well um, for improving the cleaning process and from the slide previous when we discussed when people validate, we had a customer recently who had a device and they added some tubing to the device. And so they added a new material to the vice, and they also added an IPA rinse at the end of their process. So they had a change to the material and a change to the cleaning process. It turned out when they added that IPA rinse in the tubing, the IPA wasn't allowed to evaporate enough. And so we were seeing spikes in TOC values, which we, is a test method that we'll discuss later. And so during their routine monitoring, they were getting a spike in their TOC and they were able to determine that it was the IPA being left over in the tube. And so they were able to go back to the drawing board, they added a water rinse at the end of their process, and they were able to remove those IPA residuals and get their devices back to the limits that they were normally seeing. To choose a sampling plan, it's not always feasible for manufacturers and other larger vendors to test every single device that they manufacture. So a lot of people will determine what they deem to be the worst case device. Worst case being the most difficult to clean, a large surface area, uh, a device that has maybe holes or more porous textures that could hold on to residues more. And so they'll group them or test just the worst case device as part of the validation. People will also group their devices into families that have similar material sizes and shapes, for example. 
and test only certain devices from a group. So again, they don't have to test every single device they manufacture and reduce time and cost in the validation process. People will also test coupons, which are mock devices. Sometimes it's not always feasible for manufacturers to send us multiple of the devices that they manufacture, for example, a very, very large implant. And so they'll send us maybe a little piece of the metal that mimics the functionality of the device that goes through the same process and we'll test that coupon rather than the actual device. People also send us clean and place samples where they will use swabs maybe on equipment that can't be sent to the lab and we will test the swabs and that swab will be used to extract residues from the surface of the device when they can't send us samples. And so these are some test options on what samples to send during the validation. The next step in setting up a cleaning validation is if possible to determine the potential contaminants that your device comes in, comes in contact with during the manufacturing and cleaning process. Some of these compounds are things like oils, lubricants, polishing compounds, things of that nature from the manufacturing process. Also from the cleaning process, maybe a detergent or an, an alcohol rinse, like we mentioned previously, or things from the passivation process. Anything that comes in contact with your device that could be a potential contaminant left over. And then once we've determined the potential contaminants, we will divide them into groups based on their solubility, whether those contaminants are water soluble, non-water soluble, or insoluble particulates. And from these groups, we can then decide which analytical test method would be best to quantify those surface residues. And so it's very, very helpful if we can determine the potential contaminants up front. Sometimes a lot of companies don't know their potential contaminants, and that's very common. And we would recommend trying to cover the unknowns with the validation if you're, if you're not sure. And we definitely have options to do that as well. So choosing a test method based on the contaminants and the solubility we discussed on the previous slide, we can choose a test method that would be best for the process. These are the three analytical test methods we offer at our laboratory, and all these are also mentioned in that governing ASTM standard 2847 that covers cleaning validations as a whole. The first method is a UV-Vis spectroscopy. The second is TOC, or total organic carbon. And the third is a gravimetric method that also has its own governing ASTM standard, F2459, that dictates that test method. And we'll go into a little bit more in depth into all these uh, test options right now. So with UV-Vis, this test is most commonly used to quantify the amount of residues left over from the detergents in the process. With this test method, the contaminant needs to be able to scan well on the UV-Vis instrument. And so within every compound we have, we do kind of a mini validation where we go over precision, linearity, and determine the LOD and LOQ, depending on how well we can scan that on our UV-Vis. And this test is most, op um, most commonly used for detergents and to quantify the remaining detergent resi uh, residuals. With this test method, we take the device and we do an extraction in water, and then we scan that extract on the instrument. We then take a sample of the actual uh, detergent or the compound we are going to examine, scan that as well. We will compare the two scans and then based on the LOD, LOQ, we've determined from the validation, we take a particular wavelength that's specific to the compound, and whatever is absorbing at that wavelength is the quantitative amount that we assume to be the compound in question. And so this, case give, uh, this test method gives a worse case, as other things could be absorbing, uh, absorbing on that wavelength as well, uh, other than the detergent, for example. Uh, but this test is great. A lot of companies just maybe have one detergent in their, val uh, in their process, for example, and this is a great test option for them to determine how much specifically detergent is being left over on their device. Uh, with this test as well, the contaminants must be uh, water-soluble, as we can only use water as the extraction solvent. 
So there's a, a limitation with this test, but, but a great option for some people. The next test method is TOC, or total organic carbon. TOC is a very well established and recognized test method to show cleanliness. We also, with this test, use water as the extraction solvent and use a sonication technique to remove those surface residues. And then we take an aliquot of the extract and run it on the instrument, and then we're able to get our TOC readout. TOC is non-specific um, as we are quantifying the total amount of oxidizable carbon that was removed from the surface of the device. With, with TOC, the limitations as well is we can only use water as the extraction solvent and it will only quantify things that are primarily comprised of carbon. And so in consulting with people to determine what test plan would be best for them, we often look at the MSDS sheets of the contaminants and look at that chemical makeup. And if most of the contaminants are primarily comprised of carbon and water soluble, TOC is a great option. TOC has a very low limit of detection. We can detect down to 11 parts per billion. And so TOC is a great option if, again, the contaminants you're looking for, if TOC would be able to pick those up. The third test method that we have to quantify the surface residues is the gravimetric ASTM method. This test method also uses a sonication technique to remove the surface residues using a particular solvent. And the benefit of the gravimetric test is that we can use both polar and nonpolar solvents to remove those residues. So if you're looking for oils in particular, for example, most oils are non-water soluble. And so with the gravimetric test, we can use a non-soluble solvent to remove and quantify those residuals as well. And so a lot of people where water wouldn't work as their extraction solvent would use the gravimetric test and have that as an option for them. Uh, this ASTM standard also requires that the extraction efficiency be performed and be greater than 75%. And that's a great to, uh, control to include with the testing to show how well the test method and solvent chosen are at removing the residues from your devices. Also another benefit to the gravimetric test is that once we have the residues, we can scan those residues on our FTIR to identify the residues. And so that's a, that's a very helpful tool with this test. If you're getting a lot of residue and want to know where it's coming from, which most people do, we can scan and then we scan the residue and compare it against our library of known compounds and get a match. And so then we're able to determine what is being left over in the residue. So you can go back to the drawing board again to your cleaning validation, and perhaps we need to introduce a more vigorous rinsing to remove what's being left over from your device. So you can see with kind of all of the three test methods, it really depends on your process and what contaminants your device comes in contact with, and one or maybe all three of the methods would work for you. Uh, there's also overlap, for example, if you're looking for your detergent, um, all three of the tests would be able to pick them up. Say the detergent was primarily comprised of carbon, water soluble, the gravimetric TOC and detergent residual test would be able to quantify that residue. So you may not necessarily have to do all three tests. It would be what's most beneficial for you. A lot of people, when they do not know all of the compounds that are being used in their process, we use the gravimetric test method and use a polar and nonpolar solvent to try and capture all of those residues that are being left behind. The gravimetric test can also pick up those insoluble particulates that are often a concern, such as metal flakes or things like that left over from the manufacturing process. To mention again as well, there's no regulatory limit set for these analytical tests. And the FDA has been hesitant to, to publish too much information and, and limits in general about this, and that's due to the, the variation of devices, the components used in the processes, and the processes themselves. It's been very difficult to come up with an actual numeric value to say you have to have less than this amount of residue to have a clean device. And so that's been very, very difficult to set 
or regulatory authorities. And so it's up to the manufacturers or who was ever doing the testing to justify the residue levels. And these are some of the most common options we see our clients use to justify those residue levels. We often see people comparing clean and unclean devices. We'll test an unclean, compare that to the clean, and hopefully you'll see a reduction in residue, and that reduction in residue can help show that your cleaning process is effective. A lot of people, when they've implemented a new change to their process, will compare the new to the old to see how beneficial that change was and if, it's, if you should implement it and keep it. A lot of people also use historical data and trending to set their limits. For example, people will send in samples to routinely monitor with TOC testing, and people will take what they've normally, normally been seeing as their results and take an average and then set their limit based on what they've seen in the past. Uh, people also compare the residue values to the analytical detection limit of the test and say if our test methods can't even detect the amount of residue that's there, my device must be clean. Probably most common as well as well uh, to justify these residue levels is comparing LD50 values to the contaminants. And so in this situation, our clients will look at their list of contaminants, pick what they deem to be worst case, and then take the LD50 value. And then they'll compare that residue level with the LD50 value to determine if it's clean or not. And then we always recommend adding additional tests to the analytical tests, such as cytotoxicity, endotoxin, and bioburden, including those tests as part of the cleaning validation to help show additional data about how clean your device is. And endotoxin and bioburden are options lined out in that governing ASTM standard as well. Cytotoxicity is actually not in there, but that's something we recommend at our lab to show whether the residues that were obtained, if they're cytotoxic or not. What's helpful with these additional tests as well is that some of the tests have their own acceptance criteria, such as the MEM elution and LAL test methods. And so it's helpful. So once you've got that number, that you quantified with the analytical tests. If you have passing cytotoxicity and LAL scores as well, you can help show, yeah, I've got that number, but there's no endotoxin and it's non-cytotoxic. So that can help in overall justifying that you have a clean device. I have also included just a quick case study to go over some numbers of the tests we've been talking about. So this particular client had a titanium implant that had a coating on it. They decided to go with the gravimetric test method. They sent us one unclean sample and a clean sample. On the unclean sample, we did an exhaustive extraction, which is three repetitive extractions to determine the extraction efficiency. We were able to get a 91% extraction efficiency, which means we were able to remove 91% of the surface residues. And that reduction in residue on that first extraction on the uncleaned, we were able to get 6.45 milligrams. And on the clean sample, 0.45 milligrams. So that reduction in residue there can help show that your cleaning process was very effective at removing those surface residues. And then including the MEM elution test, scoring zero, showing no cell lysis, is helpful to justify that 0.45 milligram residue level. It's non-cytotoxic. This client also included bioburden testing and received scores of non-detectable levels of bioburden. And so there's no aerobic bacteria or fungi concerns as well in that 0.45 residue value. And so I hope this is helpful to kind of show how the results work together as part of the cleaning validation. Uh, quickly as well, I've also included just kind of a mock manufacturing and cleaning process. We often go over this in consulting with our clients and look at the different processes and where the contaminants are coming from. What's coming from the machining process, the deburring, the polishing, what's being left over, and then determine what test method is best. Also, people will take, um, there's often multiple cleaning steps in the process. 
and people will do before and after comparisons to see how beneficial the different cleaning steps are in the process. Maybe they can remove one of the steps if it's not really doing anything and save time and money in their process as well. And also to list the references that we talked about today, the first is the GMP requirement for the good manufacturing process to have this data on file. The ASTM 2459 is the gravimetric test standard, and the ASTM F2847 is the overall cleaning validation test method. But thank you so much for coming, and I hope it was helpful for you.